Okay. Um, so I have finished the um, exam questions for you to study. I will be posting them shortly after this lecture, so you can expect them sometime this afternoon. Um, there are quite a few questions that will guide you through the um, studying process, and as, as I mentioned, these are all questions that have the chance of actually appearing on your exam. Um, so there shouldn't be any surprises, but there will be a lot more material for you to go through than you'll actually experience on your exam. I have probably about double the amount of questions um, that you'll actually experience um, on your exam on the study guide. Um, so I've decided that I'm going to post that as a Word file and a PDF and not as a Top Hat test because Top Hat tests are going to be way too clunky for you to study from. Um, so those will both appear in a folder that is um, exam review. It should be towards the bottom of your file tree on Top Hat. Um, and they'll appear this afternoon. You also have a homework that's due on Wednesday. You're um, assigned to read two chapters, chapters six and seven from the, um, the Gulf Making of an American Sea book. And I have uh, three questions for you to answer on Top Hat for homework. Those are participation credit um, questions. So please get your, get your easy points. Um, also a warning, reading those chapters is gonna make you wish really, really, really bad that you could go fishing. So I don't know <laughs> if you're really busy with classwork, you're going to have to like steal yourself to resist the urge to go fishing. Okay. Today, the lecture is going to be on salt marsh. Today, we're going to cover salt marsh zonation, marsh species interactions, common salt marsh species, salt marsh microbes, peat formation, and acid sulfate soils. The learning goals for today are under to understand that salt marsh zonation is a balance between flooding tolerance and competitive domin dominance. We've touched on this a little bit, but we're going to go into more detail because it's very important. To learn how the species in a salt marsh all work off of each other and interact in, comple in a complex ecosystem. We'll learn that marsh microbes exist in a lively marsh mutualism. That salt marsh peat stores blue carbon and helps a marsh to grow vertically. And then areas where old productive peat forming marsh has been converted to farmland, acid soil, soil, acid sulfate soil runoff is a huge deal. So... I'm wondering, I'm guessing living around here, that you have, um, as you're driving or as you're walking or as you're stopped at a gas station, occasionally smelled a rotten egg smell. And the reality is it's usually not sewage treatment. Usually that rotten egg smell is from a marsh. Although we respond to that smell with disgust, it's actually evidence that there's a lot of life going on right under your feet. And even though we have talked about salt marshes a bit in past lectures on coastal habitats, they're so important and you all are surrounded by so much salt marsh, so it really warrants a whole class of its own. And so that's what we're going to do today. So we'll build upon some of the concepts that we learned in the coastal habitats and we'll apply them specifically to a marsh setting and go into a lot more detail. So just a reminder in case you missed the coastal habitats lecture, a salt marsh is a common habitat within estuaries. They are a type of coastal wetland. Uh, they're really widespread, so they aren't uh, only found in this region. They can be found on every coast in the United States and many coasts around the world. They have a wide, um, wide range. They're strongly affected by the tides. They're coastal environments. They're subject to tidal activity. Um, they are used to having the water level change constantly, daily, multiple times per day, sometimes quite drastically. And if you'll recall, I mentioned that zonation is a characteristic of all coastal habitats. Salt marsh is no exception. In fact, zonation um, is very easily seen in most salt marsh environments. So we'll talk a little bit about um, this zonation. In salt marshes, the zonation is a balance between flooding tolerance and competitive dominance of the plants in the marsh. So this image here is showing you a typical pattern 
um, and typical species found in a salt marsh. Um, the name Spartina here is commonly used to refer to, um, I think the common name for the grass is cord grass. Um, I will use Spartina because it's, it's a really cool genus name and because it actually has kind of become the common name for this grass. So when you hear me say Spartina, I'm talking about this cord grass here. And then note that some really obnoxious scientist a couple of years ago changed the genus name from Spartina to Spora, Sporobolus, um, which is a genus name that I just refuse to use. So it's going to be Spartina forever. Um, so anyways, the plants in the lower marsh, uh, they have limitations and they are um, limited by competition. So these Spartina plants, these cord grass plants, they will be overgrown by better competitors um, like these upper marsh plants like Iva and Juncus. Um, so they're confined to the lower marsh where Iva and Juncus can't survive. So they're in kind of a stressful area because they're poor competitors. They'll be overgrown by any other plant really in the area. The plants in the upper marsh also have a limitation that limits how far down they can grow. So they're limited by flooding. Um, flooding will deprive most plants of their of needed oxygen if they don't have special adaptations to deal with it. And Iva and Juncus don't have as many special adaptations as, for instance, Spartina does. So they're limited to the upper marsh by flooding stress. So that's why in this image it says the lower limit is set by physical stress, in this case flooding, and the upper limits of these species is set by competition. So you would imagine the best competitor here would be Iva, and in the absence of any sort of stress of flooding, Iva would take over this salt marsh ecosystem. When I say the best competitor, I'm going to talk about a little more about what I mean by this, um, but I'm going to include this as honors advanced material, so I don't expect OCS 1005 students to know this for the exam. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about competition, salt marsh competition, what makes a good competitor in a salt marsh. So in the 1980s, there were a series of experiments that were done that were marsh transplant experiments. Essentially what they did is they would take some marsh plants from the lower marsh and they would dig them up and they would plant them in the mid marsh and in the high marsh and they would say, okay, Spartina, we're giving you the best chance to thrive. Um, go ahead and show us what you can do. And going, we're going to see how you perform when you're surrounded by Iva or surrounded by Juncus. And when they did that, these Spartina plants did not do well. So they were quickly strangled out. They quickly died. That's I've colored them a little bit in brown here, showed dying Spartina. Um, so these experiments revealed that there's something going on that limits these species to the low marsh. And the scientists decided that this was interspecific competition. And that's a form of competition that happens between individuals of different species when they compete for the same resources in an ecosystem. So for plants that would largely be light or nutrients. The, the poor competitor, which in this case would be Spartina, is displaced to a habitat that is physically stressful um, in the lower intertidal. And that's because the better competitors are able to occupy the high ground. In the salt marsh, they're all competing for um, generally nutrients. So none of these plants really form like a tree form where they can block out a whole bunch of light. And so really the resource that these are competing for are um, nutrients. Iva and Juncus are more efficient at taking up nutrients than Spartina is. So when they're in the same area, these plants are stealing all the nutrients from the soil and Spartina is essentially starved. This image up here is showing you how light competition can happen through shading. So in this case, this flowering plant is shading the, um, this uh, marsh grass plant. But in the salt marsh, this is more typically what happens, nutrient competition. So in this case, this grassy plant here has a lot of small roots with a lot of surface area. It's growing over into the area where this marsh grass is growing. And these small roots with lots of surface area are stealing away all of the available nutrients in the soil. 
and making it really difficult for this marsh grass to live. I also want to talk a little bit about the risk of flooding for plants. Um, if you're going to try and grow a garden around here, it's really good for you to know what might happen if, um, you know, the garden has poor drainage and if, if it ends up flooding. So let's talk about this in terms of what happens for marsh plants. Flooding is typically a death sentence for most plants, unless they have adaptations to deal with it. Spartina, since it lives in the lower marsh and it has to deal with the tidal changes every single day, it has plenty of adaptations to deal with flooding. The environmental consequences of flooding include, and the big one is, oxygen deficiency, but there is also a buildup of plant toxins, soil compaction, and a buildup of acid. The consequences to a plant are that when toxins build up, a plant has difficulty producing energy, and so it must slow its metabolism. And also, uh, oddly enough, even though a plant is surrounded by water, a plant can actually die of thirst, essentially, when it's being flooded. There's an internal water deficit for plants that are flooded. That's because the root structure, when it's flooded, it'll break down. And there's a decrease in root permeability, so not a lot of stuff is able to get into the roots and supply the plant with needed water and oxygen. So the responses of a plant, that some adaptations a plant can, um, can have to deal with this flooding, are new energy pathways that proceed without oxygen. So this would be fermentation. And here I've defined fermentation as the extraction of energy from carbohydrates, in the absence of oxygen. So typically respiration, which is extracting energy from carbohydrates in the presence of oxygen, that would be, that would be for instance, what we use to um, go ahead and get our energy. But a plant can also ferment to get some energy when there's no oxygen available. So Spartina will use alcoholic fermentation, which is converting sugars into energy ethanol, and carbon dioxide. And that ethanol is the reason that this pathway is called alcoholic fermentation. The ethanol, in this case, is a byproduct. A plant can also develop adaptations that are physical changes in its structure. So for instance, there, it can develop root structures that help regulate water uptake. So that way it has more control over the water that it's, that it's pulling into um, its, its tissue. It can develop aranchyma in the stems. And aranchyma I've um, defined over here as soft plant tissue containing air spaces, basically just air pouches in, in the plant tissue. And these act as ways to store and transport oxygen. So in that case, if the roots are flooded, the plant may supply submerged portions of the plant with oxygen from these aranchyma. And Spartina do have plenty of aranchyma in their stems. And the last one, um, the last physical change is adventitious roots. And so adventitious roots are plant roots that form from any non-root tissue, like the trunk or the stem, or even in some cases, the leaves. And this allows roots to grow above the flood line and supply the plant with oxygen. So marsh plants can just shoot out roots above the flood line. They have no problem getting oxygen, and those roots would not be subject to breaking down because they won't be flooded. And the very last adaptive response I won't go into detail on is resistance to toxins. There are a variety of mechanisms that plants have developed to resist those toxins that build up during flooding. I want you to know that that does exist, but I don't, I'm not, you know, this class isn't really for going over all of these like enzymatic changes that have to happen um, for resistance to toxins. This is plenty of detail, I think, for most of you. Okay. All right, so um, even though there's a lot of competition and um, 
a lot of separation of species into zones in the salt marsh. It doesn't mean that the salt marsh community is, you know, every plant for itself and nobody works together to create this ecosystem. In fact, the species in a salt marsh all work off of each other and interact in a very complex ecosystem. Um, you have a lot of facilitation in salt marshes and facilitation is defined as interactions that benefit at least one of the participants and then don't harm either of the participants in the interaction. So there's no harm in a facilitation, someone is benefited. And of all of these interactions, um, these tight interactions in a salt marsh, that means that without any one of these species, the entire environment could be different. So some examples of some key interactions in a salt marsh are as follows. So plants like Spartina provide food and shelter for marsh organisms and their roots and material um, that they grow below ground also prevents erosion of the marsh surface. So they're providing benefits um, like those. But those organisms that live within the grasses, they also aerate the soil and improve Spartina growth through this aeration. And then mussels and oysters that live at the marsh edge they fertilize the marsh grass through the production of feces, and they also stabilize the marsh edge. So there are a lot of benefits um, that go back and forth between all of these organisms in addition to the competitive interactions we've talked about, and most of these benefit at least one of the participants. Since you're surrounded by salt marsh so often, I thought it would be good to show you some key players in the Gulf Coast salt marsh ecosystem. So here are some of those. So we have um, the ribbed mussel, which is a mussel that you commonly find at the edge of salt marshes. Probably the most common snail that you'll find um, in salt marshes, it's quite visible above the water surface, is the marsh periwinkle. If you go ahead and tow a net in the marsh, you'll pull up a bunch of these little clear shrimp. These are dagger blade grass shrimp. Great food for everybody in the marsh. Sometimes depending on where you're, where you're at, you'll see um, small oyster reefs form at the edge of the marsh, and those are eastern oyster. Um, throwing a cast net, you might catch some gulf keelyfish or bull minnows, they're commonly called. And if you walk out into the marsh, um, you'll notice scurrying around a bunch of hermit crabs, and those are thin striped hermit crabs usually. If you see any little heads popping up out of the water, it's most likely diamondback terrapins, which are a saltwater turtle. They're not sea turtles. Um, blue crab, obviously very important in, on the Gulf Coast as a food source, as a fishery, um, but they oftentimes will live in um, salt marshes. And fiddler crabs as well, very common on the salt marsh um, sediment surface. And eating all of these critters, we have a variety of wading birds. I've chosen the great blue heron here to represent these. Generally, if you're walking around in a marsh, you see plenty of great blue herons. And then also some larger predators. Obviously, the American alligator would be in some of the fresher portions of the marsh. And bull sharks. We do have bull sharks in our salt marshes in Louisiana. Um, in fact, there have been bull shark sightings in um, Bayou Manchac, which is not that far away, and bull shark attacks in Lake Pontchartrain. So they're there. There are also lots of organisms that are not so visible. And these are the mic uh, microorganisms, the microbes of the marsh. And actually they're responsible for um, that rotten egg smell that's so characteristic of approaching a salt marsh. So when you smell that rotten egg smell, you're actually smelling evidence of bacterial life in the salt marsh. <laughs> 
under the marsh surface, um, sediment surface, if you go just a little bit into the sediment, um, there's actually no oxygen there. The oxy oxygen gets used up real fast by all of the abundant life in the salt marsh. And so the bacteria that live in the sediment without any oxygen, they have to develop different pathways in order to get their energy. They can't just do normal respiration. They have to do um, respiration using other materials like sulfate instead of oxygen. And the bacteria that do this are called sulfate reducing bacteria. And these are the ones that produce that hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs. And so they use sulfate to, um, to get energy to break down sugars, and then they produce hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct. And that can accumulate in the marsh and um, has that characteristic smell. Unfortunately, hydrogen sulfide is toxic. It's not great for a variety of life, not great for plants to grow in. It's a toxin. Um, however, there are bacteria in the marsh that use that hydrogen sulfide. Nothing goes to waste. And these are the purple sulfur bacteria. And they actually sit near the surface of the sediment. And they can do photosynthesis using hydrogen sulfide. So instead of using carbon dioxide, like... Um, you know, plants would for to do photosynthesis. These purple sulfur bacteria use hydrogen sulfide to do photosynthesis. And when they do so, they produce sulfate. So you can see this here. Hydrogen sulfide goes in to the purple sulfur bacteria and they produce sulfate. And the sulfate can then in turn be used by the sulfate reducing bacteria, which produce hydrogen sulfide which is again used by a purple sulfur bacteria in this cycle. And so these two groups of bacteria are involved in a very productive marsh mutualism. And a mutualism is a type of facilitation that's beneficial to both, um, both partners. So both organisms involved, both bacteria benefit because they're both providing food for the other. Pretty cool. Yeah, I'll give you a couple more seconds on that slide. I'm sure this is new material for most of you. But now you know where the rotten egg smell comes from. Really, really nerdy fun fact for your next party. Okay. So, um, we can't talk about salt marshes without talking about peat. Peat is the foundation layer of a salt marsh. Um, the soil underneath the salt marsh is made up of mud and peat. So what is peat? It's just decaying plant matter. Deposits of decaying plant matter. Sometimes it can be really thick. So here's a picture here where the marsh bank has eroded away and it's exposed a thick layer of that peat. You can see some of the old decaying roots in here. It's just a bunch of decaying, decaying plant matter. Peat and salt marshes results from the degradation of roots, stems, leaves, and marsh plants. And even though this material is decomposing and shrinking down in size, what actually happens is that material accumulates at a greater rate than decomposition can happen. There's a lot of material in the salt marsh, a lot of marsh grass. It's constantly adding to the peat and it keeps up. Um, or exceeds the rates of decomposition. And that means that peat accumulation can help the marsh to grow vertically so it can keep up with sea level rise. And that is in fact what happens in most, in most places where we have healthy marshes and sea level rise that doesn't happen too fast is that the marsh is able to build up. If you remember our discussion of blue carbon, where a bunch of carbon is trapped in marshes, this um, you know may start to kind of make a lot of sense. So peat is where a lot of that blue carbon is actually stored. The carbon in the plant leaves, instead of being consumed and respired by bacteria, um, it actually gets buried in this peat. It's not fully decomposed, it's buried in, in this peat layer. 
and so it can be stored as blue carbon. The peat layer is also where a lot of sulfate reducing bacteria live. There's not a lot of oxygen once you get into the peat layer. It's pretty just a, pretty just a thick layer of decomposing plant matter. And so there are a lot of bacteria that don't use oxygen, including sulfate reducing bacteria, which don't need light either. And so that means that in the peat layer, hydrogen sulfide accumulates. So it smells extra eggy in there. I can almost smell the eggs coming from that photo. I really like that smell, honestly, but that's probably why I do work in a marsh. So the thing about hydrogen sulfide is that when purple sulfur bacteria are not around, Hydrogen sulfide may also bind with iron, producing pyrite. This doesn't really involve any bacteria. It's just kind of something there's iron around, there's hydrogen sulfide around. Um, they, they bond and form pyrite, which is a stable molecule. And pyrite actually is not toxic, so that's good. So that's a way for hydrogen sulfide to be used up in the peat layer. It accumulates, but it might not get to the point where it's super, super toxic because it's forming pyrite. Um, pyrite is stable and does not cause any environmental problems, that is, until the peat is drained. So peat tends to be um, submerged. The whole idea is that peat is building up the marsh to deal with flooding. It's submerged a lot. It's always pretty damp. Um, it doesn't ever really dry out completely. But if it does, for some reason, pyrite gets exposed to air. And what happens is sulfuric acid forms when pyrite is exposed to air. And the next time it rains, that sulfuric acid will drain into nearby water features. And this is known as acid sulfate soil runoff. This is a picture of some acid sulfate soil runoff. It looks like a big chemical spill, but it's actually the natural consequence of that marsh peat being dried out and then wet again. It has this characteristic rusty orange tinge, and this is because those iron minerals in pyrite, um, they form iron oxide minerals, so essentially rust, along with that sulfuric acid. So it's rusty acid water. As you might expect, this is, can cause a lot of problems for the ecosystem. So um, the issue is that humans like to drain marsh for farmland. Marsh can be really productive farmland. Obviously, coastal land is worth a lot of money. And so we like to buy coastal land, drain it, and use it for other things. And when they do this in areas where there's a bunch of old, productive, peat-forming marsh, when they convert this to farmland, acid sulfate soil runoff becomes a huge problem. It causes extreme acidification and heavy metal contamination. And in some places of the world where this phenomenon is really common, such as um, New South Wales, Australia, acid sulfate soils have caused catastrophic damage. So they've caused deaths of wide expanses of coastal vegetation, as shown in this top photo here. All those are dead trees and that characteristic rusty orange color of the acid sulfate soils. Alarmingly, it that acidic water, it becomes really, really, really low pH. Like if you're used to dealing with pH, it gets down to about a pH of two, which is like pretty much about as acidic as you can get. Like it, it would actually, you would feel it. You would feel feel it burn a little bit if you were to put your hand in it. <clears throat> wouldn't cause like huge caustic burns, but you would feel it like, like having your hand in lemon juice pretty much. Um, so it eats away at concrete structures. And this is shown here, these pilings have been eaten away at by the, by the acid sulfate soil. It also eats away at shells of organisms. And so it's destroyed in many places, um, oyster aquaculture industries because oysters can't grow in these areas anymore. Unfortunately, it's also an extremely hard problem to fix. And so to fix it, what you actually have to do is restore flow to all of the original marshland. People aren't great about giving up their coastal 
land that they own. So this is this can be really hard to do. And also when you do it, when you restore flow, um, you have an area that has a lot of acidification for a really long time before things get better. So you kind of make things worse before things get better. But this is the only way to fix it. And so this is largely what Australia is doing. They're removing barriers to water flow. They're removing floodgates and letting water back into these areas that have been drained. All right, so at this point, I've got a quiz for you, and then we'll move on to an activity for the rest of class time. I know, isn't that funny? I love that picture. All right, so quiz question. As you are driving towards New Orleans on I-10, you notice the rotten egg smell of marsh. Your friend in the passenger seat accuses you of breaking wind and then says it smells like death. You know for a fact that this smell is not the smell of death. How do you correct your friend? Oh no. Is it better now? Good, good, good. I think I just needed to go to the next screen. And I have one answer outstanding, but I'm going to close this soon. So hit submit if you haven't already. Nice. Okay. So the answer here is B. The rotten egg smell produced by the marsh is evidence of a thriving microbial community that includes includes sulfur reducing bacteria which are producing hydrogen sulfide giving it the smell um, it's not the smell of respiration by larger animals um, it's not the smell of decomposing animal tissue even though it smells really gross um, it's a completely different smell from from animal tissue decomposition it's also a completely different smell from um, sewage treatment plants and a different source Okay, so um, for the last 15 minutes or so of class, I have two options for you for your activity. The first one is um, to make a marsh infographic. And so I have this, um, this PDF file that's available to you called salt, salt marsh infographic in the 11 in class folder. It's a large poster that has a bunch of panels that explain a lot of things about the salt marsh. Um, in particular, I want you to look at the panel at the bottom that's talking about seasons in the salt marsh because um, you'll be responsible for this material. But this is kind of just more of a way to show you what I'm talking about when I say that you can submit your final project as an infographic. I thought it might be nice to have some practice if you're an artsy person 
to create a panel of your own demonstrating info from today's class or demonstrating info from that infographic. You can try and recreate one of the panels. When I say a panel, I'm talking about just one of the sections. So like this would be a panel from that poster or this would be a panel from the poster or like this is an infographic I created for today's class. So just something quick. You're probably not going to get done in 15 minutes. Turn in what you've got. If you do not want to create art today, I have an alternative assignment called Marsh Multiple Choice that you can access in which you will be developing a multiple choice question for the exam from today's lecture. Go ahead and be creative. And also you can upvote other people's multiple choice questions if you really like one. And maybe I'll consider including some of these on the exam if I like them. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know not all of you are going to want to draw <laughs> or, or fiddle around in PowerPoint. Um, but for those of you that do, it would be good for me to know where my artists are at. And also um, just, you know, practice for infographics because you might want to submit your final project as an infographic. It could be a lot of fun if you are, are artistic. All right, let me know if you have any questions. All right, that's the end of class. Um, these are going to remain open until noon. So if you want to finish up um, and submit something after class is over, that's totally fine. And I will see you on Wednesday. Don't forget to look for those exam questions um, that will be posted later this afternoon if you want to start studying. Exams in a little under two weeks.